even though the lambda is uh, more diverse and in its form and style. Uh, still lacking some still lacking some knee training yeah so well some, some techniques so the the elbow the knee and then what we call clinch when you grab you can grab the opponent and pull and then hit him with the knees or hit him with the elbow when you hold the opponent you're not allowed to do that in sanda so that's a lacking that's an area where sanda is lacking but where sanda is better than muay thai is they have the wrestling the throwing and the chinese kicks but, but what why is uh why is the so 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 few uh, Sanda, Sanda uh, sports person appear appearing in the MMA world. So most of the MMA fighters from China are Sanda fighters. Yeah, they, uh, must be. they must be. Yeah, they are Sanda. Most of them, I would say, eighty percent or more. Their background is Sanda rather than wrestling or wushu taolu or something like that. Um, however, in my book, I talk a lot about why I believe that Chinese fighters will probably never be the dominant fighters in MMA, and I, it's just because. MMA takes so much thinking, so much creativity, so different because every, every fighter has access to every technique, every, we study these fights, we watch the previous fights over and over and we study them and we come up with strategies and ideas and thinking and there's so much fluidity and in Chinese martial art, that's not what you learn. You learn very structured. Even in Sanda. Sanda maybe a little bit less, but even the best Sanda fighters, the best Sanda fighters in China usually start as children doing Wushu Taolu. So in Shaolin Temple and in the like Tiyu and the uh, Wushao, they start the children very young, usually with Wushu Taolu. And then at some point they'll have a test after maybe two years. Oh, you're very good at Wushu Taolu. You continue with Wushu Taolu. Oh, you're not good at Wushu Taolu. You continue with Sanda. But the background, the basis of Wushu Taolu is wonderful because they have the flexibility, high kicks, jumps, movement, very good. Yeah. But they do not have the thinking that is necessary, the create, creative thinking that is necessary for MMA. Creative thinking. Yeah. Wow. When, I, when I go in an MMA fight and I see my opponent, I have to think, how will I fight this opponent? Because it'll be different than the previous opponent, previous opponent. Previous. I can't do the same thing with every opponent. Not because the Sanda uh, people don't learn uh, yeah, well, well, that's the other problem. The other problem is that they don't know how to fight on the ground. So they have wrestling, but their wrestling in Sanda is just to throw the opponent to the ground and stop. But in MMA, you have to go to the ground with the opponent and fight him on the ground, and that's the BJJ or the ground and pound. So that's the other, that's the technique weakness of Sanda. But I believe there's a, there's a mental weakness in Asian fighters, particularly in, in China. That I just think they don't they don't have the independent thinking that it takes to to win MMA fights. It seems that this kind of lack of independent thinking or creative thinking you can apply to every other field, yeah. including maybe uh, Asian world, in particular in China. Yeah. There's a, a limit of thinking. Yeah, if you look at the Zimo, if you look at the the writing, right? If you look at the letters, Chinese letters. You must do the letter exactly the same as your teacher. And exactly the same as his teacher and his teacher for a thousand years. The letters are unchanged. Who is the smartest person? The person who can write the most letters. Okay. Whereas in the Western martial art, we could say the most basic, most unique Western martial art is boxing. Boxing has six punches. I can teach you all of them today. Ten minutes, I can teach you all six punches. You will know the same number of punches as Mike Tyson. Right? But why is Mike Tyson better? Right, because it's a, it's a mental thing. He's learned how to combine creatively those six punches with his movement, with his breathing, with his body positioning. There's so much going on that can't be taught in this step by step rigid way that the traditional wusu is taught. So it's kind of a dilemma. I mean, even though the the those people you know were were good at good at uh, sanda. They come to uh, an entertainment or wrestling world very young. That kind of thinking cannot be, I mean, you know, can they adapt their thinking to the current situation? That's kind of my theory is that I, I don't know that you can because it's too late in life. By the time they would come to America to be professionals, they've already been through uh, probably, you know, 12 years of uh, either Tishao or um, Niga, Niga Wushao, right? Sports school, uh, education, 18 years of rigid, structured learning. 
and then they're going to come to MMA, 18, 19, 20 years old by the time they get to America. One of my one of my classmates at the sport university, he made it all the way to the UFC. Two fights in the UFC, he lost both times. And he lost almost all of his fights outside of China. And he's been training since he was six years old. And because I just believe they don't have the creativity. It's, it's just so different. Creativity and independence. To be able to look at the opponent. How can I fight this opponent? What must I do differently with this opponent? When I was first working with him, when I was first teaching him, I said to him, you're very good at judo. Don't let me punch you and kick you. Come, come close and use your judo. And he would... He didn't even understand, even that concept, he didn't understand that he needed to approach differently because I could kick and punch, you know, or other fighters, friends of mine in China or Asia. And I'll say to him, listen, now I'm very good at wrestling. Don't let me grab you. Whatever you do, don't let me grab you. You have to fight. Just kick and move, kick and move out of the way. And they, they, don't, they don't know how to adjust their fight style. But doesn't that take training to avoid maybe your, your, your weakening and maybe dropping? It does. It does take training, but there has to be a, it would be the same like my friend from the sports university is a pretty smart guy, but doesn't have a very good education. Could we teach him to pass mathematics and science and get a bachelor's degree in some subject in America, accounting and become an accountant? Maybe, maybe, but it would be much more difficult than if I took a kid from a normal high school that had a normal high school education and I want to teach him to be an accountant. Man, I read uh, your profile. You have been to a lot of Asian countries, and especially like, uh, uh, two of them concern me most because <laughs> yeah, Taiwan and China. Yeah. Can you uh, tell me what why what prompts you to to pursue this kind of a uh, martial art life? First place. Well, I've been doing martial arts since I was twelve years old. Uh, I started because I was getting bullied at school. And so I wanted to learn to defend myself. I was very small growing up, and, and I'm still not very tall, you know, even today. Uh, and I was getting bullied at school. So um, a friend of my father told him about a martial arts school. So I went there and I began training. And I just immediately fell in love with martial art. And I trained. Kind of, kind of style. The original school that I trained at was called American Kung Fu. And he told us all kinds of stories about the Shaolin Temple and the legends from China and things. He, he had never been to China. He developed this, this system and he, and, he, and he taught us, but it was mostly boxing and kickboxing was the actual martial art. But the foundation, the theory, the philosophy was sort of Kung Fu, Shaolin Temple, a lot of great stories about the old masters on the mountain and, and Christianity, because it, it was a Christian who was down south in the southern United States. So Christian, he said, okay, well, we're there at the temple, they follow Buddhism, here we follow Christianity, but it's the same thing. I said, okay. Strange combination. Yeah. How about the two reconciled? Oh, uh, well, there's no problem with reconciling because when you're studying fighting and it's your sport and it's your discipline and it's your way of life. So there's no contradiction with religion, particularly if you believe the conservative Christians in the South, they don't drink alcohol, they don't go to parties. You know? So this works very well if you're training for martial arts. So and of course, uh, you would never fight in anger. You'd never fight in violence. You'd never fight on the street. So this all works very well with, with, with religion, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity or anything. So you can discipline. Yeah, well. exactly. That, that was the time when you uh, grew up in Tennessee? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, half my childhood was spent in Tennessee, although I was born in New York. And um, so I grew up doing martial arts. I went to the Army. I boxed in the military. By then, I, around a, a, age 20, by the time I was 20, I realized that I really didn't have the body for martial art. I should be a boxer. Um, so I was very good at fighting. I was very good at boxing. Um, I'm short. I'm very heavy. And my family... Uh, you know, we're from, from Italy or my you know, parents and that. So my heroes growing up, my dad would always bring me stories about these different Italians who did well in America. And it was Rocky Marciano and Rocky Graziano and all these great Italian fighters, particularly Rocky Marciano, though. So he was my, about my height or maybe one inch taller. We were about the same weight and he was a heavyweight champion. So that meant he was fighting these men that were so much bigger and with the long arms and, and he was able to win. And I said, oh, I, I, I'm going to fight like him. And so that's what I did. So I fought like him and I fought in the army. And then um, eventually I got an education and I uh, went to school in Europe, came back. I was uh, working in financial industry in New York City. And then 9-11 came. And when 9-11 came, I, what, what changed you? I was in Manhattan on 9-11 day. So it changed my life because I really thought that we were all going to die. There was so much of the white 
powder and smoke blowing up and down the avenues we recovered in it and i said oh this must be some kind of chemical agent or a nerve agent and did, we're going to die an hour from now or two hours that's really what i thought i thought that we were going to die and when the mayor announced they closed the bridges tunnels subways we couldn't leave the island i thought we're sacrificing ourselves so we don't kill our family if we go home and bring this dust home and kill our family so that's i really thought my life finished on that day and then when i didn't die i said wow you know your whole life you have dreams and you say someday 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 someday's never going to come and since i was a little boy my teacher had been telling me about the shaolin temple and i said i'm going to go to the shaolin temple and that was when i made the decision even though that uh, for a time you were more into boxing yeah uh, the Shaolin Temple is uh, it remains a dream? Yeah, still remained a dream because the philosophy, the teaching was still from the Shaolin Temple, even if the mechanics were boxing and kickboxing. And uh, what, what fascinates you about the Shaolin other than uh, your, 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 your childhood, with your childhood training with the Lun in the, you know, as a child? What other than that? And there was also a TV show. When I, was a, when I was a boy, there was a TV show called Kung Fu with David Carradine. And he was a half American, half Chinese boy growing up in the Shaolin Temple. So I used to watch that. And we used to dream about it all the time. We're going to go there someday. I wish we could go there someday. And when I was going to school in Germany, there was a um, documentary on TV about a German boy who they say was the first foreigner studying the Shaolin Temple. And I said, this is really possible. I didn't know it was even possible. This, there was no internet. We didn't know anything. I didn't know if there really was a Shaolin Temple. I didn't know anything. And so when that 9-11 happened, I decided... I did a little Google, there was, then there was internet, so I did some Google search, almost the first time I ever used the internet, by the way, <laughs> and, I, for search. and there was very little information about mainland China, so I said, you know, I'll go to Taiwan, I'll learn Chinese, I'll learn whatever martial art I can in, in Taiwan, and from Taiwan, I'll figure out how to go to China, and that's, that's what I did. So what did you do? Then? So I went to Taiwan, I taught in a bushy <laughs> and I... About uh, Taiwan? Yeah, I taught English. I taught English in the Bushiban. And every weekend I got on the train, I went to a different part of Taiwan to look for some place that might interest me to look for martial arts. And one time I took a train to Kaohsiung and I was in the park and there were these steps leading up to, uh, I think there was kind of a temple or maybe a little prayer place or something at the top of the steps, but there was a Kung Fu team running up and down. And I was, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. I want to be with them. So I went to the teacher and I couldn't speak Chinese at that time, and he couldn't speak English. And I just made him understand that he should write his phone number on a paper. And I took it back with me to the school, and I had somebody call him, and he invited me to come stay with them. So I went and stayed with them and trained with them. And then, uh, and then I changed schools where I was working so I could be close to where he was. I went to a job agent, and they said, uh, well, we only have one job opening right now, and it's in this little town just outside of Kaohsiung. Nobody wants to live there. It's too small. I said, what's the name of the place? And I said, that's where the Kung Fu school is. So I got a job and it was maybe 300, 400 meters away from the Kung Fu school. Yeah. So uh, you, you spend your time in Taiwan learning in depth? Kung Fu, Kung Fu. Yeah, I studied with that Kung Fu team and, and taking Chinese lessons and teaching the Bushiban. I did that for about a year and a half. And then, okay, my Chinese was at a high enough level. I found out how to go to China and, and I went. What, what, what kind of style did you learn? So that teacher was teaching Taekwondo, which... It took me like a long time to figure that out too because I couldn't speak Chinese. Okay. Um, and then I, but, but I learned from other teachers. I was driving my motorcycle and I saw some people doing some kind of wrestling. I thought it was wrestling and it turned out it was uh, Tui So that in Taiwan, there's a kind of pushing hands, wrestling with two hands, which even in mainland China is almost not done anymore. Today, they still have the one hand. And Taiwan's one of the only places they still do two hands. So I stopped and met that teacher and he had classes from like 4.30 in the morning to five o'clock. So I'd go there, then I'd go to Chinese lessons and I'd go to the Kung Fu school and then I'd go teach. And then one day I was driving and I saw some healthy looking boys limping. And I said, oh, they must be injured from Kung Fu. So, so, they, so I asked them and they said yes. And so they got on my motorcycle or I followed them, I don't remember. And they took me and I found another teacher and I trained with him. So I just trained with everybody I could find during that year.